What's up, podcast world? Back at you. Another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody. Excited as heck today. We're bringing a company and a brand that I have a lot of pride in knowing and learning about over the last year of my life. You guys are going to love what you hear today because it has to do with America. It has to do with the back roads, the farmers, the ranchers, the growers, the nurturers, the men and women that have dedicated their lives to nurturing the land and providing food for human beings, not just humans, but all of our wildlife as well. So it fits right into what we believe in, in conservation hunting, fishing, being a provider and supporting and paying homage to the farmers and the ranchers and the individuals that make our world go round. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by our friends at Nutrient Ag Solutions for everything that you would possibly need for tilling the ground and nurturing that ground, harvesting that ground, planting everything that goes in to the ecology and the ecosystem and the sustainability of our earth, Nutrient Ag Solutions specializes in. We're going to learn a lot more about them today as I have two of their main, I guess you guys would be from the, the Western region, the, 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 the state of California, but you guys represent the company, um, uh, through a lot of different, a lot of different avenues. I want to get into a lot of that today. Rob, Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Chad. Thanks, Chad. Um, and now when I start spit firing like that, I don't want to miss anything. And sometimes I say things backwards. Like I said, harvest before plant, which you, you can kind of do that because right after you harvest, you start thinking about planting again. But, um, do you guys, is it fair to say some of the things I said in there, as far as like the, the homage, the farming, the ranching, the sustainability and talking with Eric a lot over the last year, I've really learned a lot about the word sustainability. Rob, you go first. Is it fair to say that when you wear that hat that you have on your head right now, that you are always thinking about that lifestyle, that part of our country, that part of our world with the earth and how, how it grows, what we, what we take for granted a lot of the times and how important farming and ranching is? Absolutely, Chad. I mean, you know, for us, the sustainability is just what we do every day. I mean, um, uh, you know, we have to have farmers grow crops, but we, you know, there's no better steward of the land than a farmer. And it is our job to support them every day. And, um, you know, we have to think about how we can do things, not just to be productive today, but, you know, to, to keep the, the land productive long-term, but also to support the, the, the wildlife. As you know, the farmers are, are, are the best conservationists out there and we, we've got to provide for, for this country and for the world, but we've also got to think about our wildlife and sustainability and how, how we can, you know, keep this world and, and the land productive for uh, our grandchildren. And on those same lines, Eric, are, when, when you think about a brand or a company, one of the first things that people are introduced to would be called a mission statement. Talk to me, both of you and Eric, you start, the mission statement of Nutrien and then the overall culture of Nutrien. And then obviously I want to lead into sustainability, but why Nutrien? Why has Nutrien Ag Solutions become such a force in the market worldwide? When I was in Canada, I was in Alberta and Saskatchewan in October of 2019. And it was the first year that I was like, man, there's nutrient in all these little towns that we're in. We were pulling up by these offices and these, these, you know, these little facilities that were supporting the farmers and the, in the cropland of that area, which it's huge in Canada. I mean, farming in Canada, combines in Canada. That's one of my favorite things about that, about that country. And, but why, what is the mission, Eric? And what is the culture? So, you know, the mission, not so much a mission statement, but I think the mission of nutrient as a whole, not just the retail side is, is really try to do what's best for the grower and ultimately what's best for the consumers in in not just the U S but the entire world, as Rob said, I mean, when you look at the ultimate goal of nutrient, we want to be able to provide sound agronomic inputs and advice to the grower and make sure that when that produce or animal or dairy product or whatever it may be gets to market that uh, the way it's produced and farmed in the field is something that we can all be proud of. And what it comes down to is food security, food safety, you know, making sure that people get what they need when they need it. 
Um, you know, it, it's, it's an important part of the business. You know, I think that a lot of times consumers lose track of the fact that there are actually men and women on the ground producing the things and growing the things that they, they acquire through their local grocery stores. Um, so it's a very important story for us to try to tell. I love that. And Rob, when you, when you hear the word culture, let's say that it's a, a, a gathering, let's say that it's a convention of, for nutrient. I don't know if it's a national sales meeting. I don't know if your guys as president and CEO is going to speak, but let's say there's two, three, 400 of you and you all are in Dallas, Texas at the convention center. What is the culture like when you start seeing all of these individuals, men and women that make up the nutrient culture in the company? What is that culture? What is the conversation? What is there? Is there, is there a ton of pride within the infrastructure of Nutria, nutrient and the culture of nutrient? That's like, look at what we're doing for the world per se. Yeah. You know, our, our mission put simply is, is uh, feeding the world. And for us, that means not, you know, doing it, you know, our, our main charge is to do it is to feed the world and do it safely and do it environmentally responsible, responsibly and sustainably. And so the mission is for us, the culture is, you know, to do it, but let's do it in the, in the right way. And that is the guiding principle of nutrient is, is that we, uh, you know, we've got to, we've got to think long, you know, we've got to act short term for the farmers and make them uh, productive and, and feed the world. But we've also got to do it in an environmentally responsible way and a safe way for our employees. So does a does a lot of I've always wondered this since I've met Eric and then met you, Rob, is the education part of what nutrient provides for their customer base and for the American and the world farmer rancher. Um, there's a lot of family businesses in the history of the world where the, the dad starts a company, has a son or a daughter, they start working, they start maybe sweeping the floor and work their way up in the infrastructure. Maybe one day they're lucky enough to take it over. Um, and sometimes that person or that, you know, that younger generation might say, you know what, I want to spread my wings and get into something else. In farming, it is so generational from what I've seen in my travels in Canada and America and South America. If you're born into a farming family, the chances of you staying in that in that part of the family business or the fa- you know the farming and ranching, it's I'd say it's higher than normal businesses. Like whether it was a, a you know a car dealership or a restaurant or whatever, it just seems like that 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 lifestyle is bred into the, the, you know, the kids in each farming family to where it stays generational. Is that fair to say from what you guys have seen? Yeah. I mean, I think there are exceptions, Chad. I think, you know, now, you know, as we move forward, you're seeing a lot more big corporations get involved in farming and and are, they're starting to begin to acquire some of the smaller family farms. I mean, you're seeing a lot of younger generations now, moving out of the family farms, at least out West. You know, I can't speak to the Midwest or, or how there, but I think that, uh, you know, you're correct in a lot of ways. I mean, we see a lot of people, a lot of these young kids that go to college, they go to the school and then return back to the family farms. Um, whereas maybe they're, you know, the original generation that started that family farm maybe didn't have that college degree or, or in our case, a pest control advisor's license sort of things that they needed, you know, as far as uh, from a formal education standpoint. So, you know, the younger generation, they're a lot more progressive in their practices. Um, You know, they're doing things differently than maybe their grandfathers did or their fathers did. And technology in the farm is advancing. So it's requiring these younger generations to be educated differently on what's coming versus what they've done, you know, for the last 50 years. So with that being said, and with my question of it being generational, and and I completely see where you're going with that, Eric, is does Nutrien provide that part of, is that part of your, your business model of being able to go out to that younger generation and provide the knowledge? I'm trying to figure out how it works within the Nutrien organization to make sure that, 
that it comes full circle and you know as far as business goes is it it's not just a store that you walk in and grab a bag of seed and then go out and plant it there's a ton of different elements of your guys's business and is the education one of them to where you guys have boots on the ground that are helping this new generation of farmers understand what's going on as far as the 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 techniques and the operations that are now it being introduced into the farming communities and these these farming families that are being you know either bought up by a corporation or or the chances there of being bought up, but they might be in a place to where they haven't sold yet or explain that to me. Is there a, a huge education process that is going into that from Nutrien? Yeah, Chad, we have uh, boots on the ground in, in every corner of, of the U S you mentioned Canada, South America as well, also Australia, but you know, we pride ourselves in having, you know, highly skilled um, uh, people that can provide um, crop consultants that can provide the the knowledge to help a farmer through every part of their operation and, and offer services as well. And in some areas we do spraying, we do ground preparation, we do, you know, so, so it's a very complete offering to the farm. And, and, you know, I think we would, we, we're probably unique and we're so involved with the farmer from, from uh, beginning to end of the crop. I mean, we we are, we are not only, financially tied to the farmer, but, but, uh, it's our industry is very unique that we're, we're very, um, it's a very much a relationship business, a trust business where, you know, they're entrusting us with their livelihood. And, um, you know, we have to, to, uh, prove our metal every day to be able to earn that customer's business because there's, there's a lot on the line. Um, so we, we stay on top of the latest, um, technology in our industry, the latest, uh, you know, for example, hybrid uh, corn hybrids in the Midwest, um, different, different, uh, uh, techniques or different, um, fertilizers or, you know, any kind of offering that might be able to, uh, help our growers to be more productive. So that's, that's, uh, that's one of the main, uh, you know, points I would make on nutrients. We're, we're cutting edge as far as technology we're, and we're uh, we're doing everything we need to every day to be able to uh, to, to help our customers be on the, the leading edge from a technology standpoint. So, Eric, with what Rob said, and I guess I, I was I wasn't using the right term when I was trying to ask my question, but is consultation a big part of it, Eric? Is can if I if I called you guys and I said, hey, I'm in the area and I'm looking to buy this piece of ground and here's what I want to do with that ground. And let's just, let's take, let's take Northern California and I want to, I want to get into nuts. I want to, I want to start orchards. Can I come to Nutrien and get consultation through your guys' office and your infrastructure to take that ground from zero to hero? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I would say Nutrien as a whole, uh, I would say, you know, Obviously, I'm biased, but I'd say we have the best crop consultant force in in the U.S. for sure. Um, what what you're able to do with our bank of knowledge, whether it's you know using our labs, um, using our consultants, you know, mixed with the the years of data on soil maps, um, looking at uh, nutrient analysis, you know soil depth characteristics, looking at drainage. I mean, there's a myriad of different things that go into to site prep and planning. Um, but yeah, I mean, from start to finish, you know, from Rob's point, I mean, if you want to plant some corn, we've got the seed. If you want to, if you need to till the ground and you don't have the right equipment, we got the right equipment. If you need certain types of fertilizer or, you know, you know, the big thing now and the big Thing. actually it's been a big deal for a while but it's prescription nutrition right you know the days are gone where you just put out 100 pounds of manure to the acre because that's what everybody else did so i mean now the the ability to look at a soil and analyze it all the way down to its genetic makeup is is unique in that we can find exactly what form of what type of nutrient works best for that soil or plant we can do the custom mixing, we can do the injection, we can do the different applications, but that's all prescribed by our crop consultants for the grower with the ultimate goal of being the highest yield 
of that crop and that crop being allowed to reach its genetic potential. So that's exactly what I was trying to get to the point is that everything you just said, and you use the word myriad, which that's a cool word. I like that word. Is that M Y R I R I A D Eric? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. That's a cool word. So now, now you're looking at the myriad of all these offerings, this entire portfolio of nutrient ag solutions. And you just hit on a bunch of things that I was wondering about. So you could take what we would call a flashlight farmer, right? That's got, he's got to have 15 to 40 acres that he's, you know, he's trying to get something going on. Or you could take a generational farmer that has thousands of acres or a farmer that owns some, but he's leasing out a bunch, which you see a lot too. And, or, you know, he's hired out to farm other land. You can go in with your team and you can say, take soil samples and you can say, we can develop and mix the correct formula that is going to produce the highest yield results out of that piece of dirt in that given p- part of the world. Right. That's, that is, would that is to me, that's like the biggest thing that, that you could do to get that, to, to take any piece of ground and offer that service. Is that one of the most important parts of the farming process? Yeah, I mean, knowing what to do and certainly not just having the right product, but having the right timing of application, right? So, I mean, the thing that most people don't realize is a lot of what we're doing right now. So, if you, you know, to use your example back in, you're talking about a nut farm, right? So, if a guy's got almond, we're, you know, better part of more than halfway through the season. But what most people don't realize is, you know, the crop that's on that tree now was set by the things we did and largely, last year so what we do from this point forward is to produce the crop for next season so i mean we're constantly looking forward you know it's impossible in agriculture in a lot of ways to look backwards and correct the things that you should have done last year last month you know you've got to do what you need to do to move forward so you know we've got to be progressive. We've got to educate our farmers in in conjunction with our supplier companies. Um, You know, we've all used the term adapt or die. You know, there's so many new technologies, whether it's fertilizer technology with, you know, emulsifications or or encapsulated products, or we're looking at crop protection chemistry where, you know, everybody wants to get more environmentally friendly. So the compounds that we're using now you know, they're not the DDTs and the things of old that came in a glass bottle. You know, these are things that we're using in ultra low concentrations, ultra low rates, more efficient, a lot more free to, to beneficial insects and invertebrates. And, and you know, there's there's things we do now that uh, will probably be completely different from what we do five years from now. So we're constantly going through changes trying to get better and better at what we do. I mean, you know, the, the world population is, is not declining, right? I mean, it's in, in the acres we have to farm on will continue to shrink as population grows. So, I mean, it's important to look for ways to maximize each acre's efficiency, right? Because we've got less acres to grow on. The two things we're never going to have enough of are land and water. Makes perfect sense. And when you start to, when you say things like, uh, and Rob, you take this as on what Eric said there is the things that we're doing now in 50, in 60 months, five years from now might not, you know, be working the same. It might not be um, considered efficient enough, whatever the case is, obviously evolving and, 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 and making sure that you are caught up to date with what's going on in the world. Take me back and you guys, I want, uh, in as far as what we do in hunting, right? Um, take me back to when this, this, corn craze started and i don't know if that's an immature question of do i am i just speaking that i really don't understand that corn has been this affluent and um in america and for this for forever because it seems to me like in the last 10 years or so maybe a little bit less maybe a little bit more corn has just like blown up and i don't know if it's starting to decrease now but but there was a run there to where it the amount of corn being grown in the Pacific Northwest, like Eastern Washington or Eastern Oregon and Montana, and then the Dakotas and then Minnesota, all the way down all the flyways, corn was everywhere. Was it always that way? Or is it, is, did it have to do with the fuels and the ethanol? What happened to make corn such a steady crop in our country? 
Yeah, Chad, I, I, you know, I'm not an expert on, on, on dynamics, but, you know, I, I think, I think you're, you're right on. I think the, the ethanol, um, you know, the, the state's mandating the ethanol content in our, in our fuels, um, you know, in an effort to make the fuels burn cleaner drove a lot of that. Right. And we, we, uh, we've seen the acres, you know, uh, they ebb and flow like acres of crop acres do, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we're producing more corn, um, and, and you're seeing, you know, you've seen more corn over the past few years produced in areas where you, you would have never seen it before. And, uh, you know, that again, we're, we're probably going backwards a little bit on, on corn this year, uh, at least in the West. And, and I know in, in other areas, um, you know, they're projecting a pretty, pretty large planted crop, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the corn craze, uh, as you put it was, it is really driven by, by the ethanol. Right. And, and export markets as well, you know, with the world population growing and, and the, the, the desire for, for protein and in, uh, you know, uh, other countries that, that probably didn't demand as much protein in the past. But, but I, I would say, yeah, I mean, those, those, those things drove the, uh, the corn craze. And, um, you know, as Eric said, we're going to have to continue to grow, you know, to, to grow the, there's going to be more and more demand for corn. Um, you know, growing over time and, and we're going to have to produce in areas where we didn't produce before, you know, you're going to see corn grown and uh, you know, with some of the hybrids, you're going to see corn grown in Southern Canada. You're going to see corn grown on acres where, you know, our fathers, uh, our grandfathers would have never thought of planting a corn crop. And, and that really goes back to the technology, you know, we're, we're you know, can, can we grow a, a crop of corn in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa? Well, uh, with the right genetics, we can, and that, and that's what uh, you know. Technology is bringing us these days is is the ability to produce, you know, in areas um, and make areas productive that we you know, we just couldn't twenty years ago. And and the things we'll see twenty years from uh, from now in agriculture, I think we, we have no uh, we have no idea or no per- good concept of, of what we'll see. It'll it'll be it'll be world changing. With the, with the with technology, Eric, has it changed what we consider? And in hunting, you always see this in our regulations and stuff. But has technology changed traditional farming practices? And I, where I want to lead into, Eric, is is flooded corn a traditional farming practice? Because we see a lot of this in the duck hunting world that uh, of hunting over flooded corn. Is that a traditional practice in farming that it would not be considered baiting with ducks coming in there because that corn has water on it and now they can, you know, pretty much live their life in there and have an un, you just an unlimited amount of food, right? Well, in California, in the rice country, ducks thrive, puddle ducks thrive on flooded rice. That's been deemed a traditional or normal farming practice because farmers were forced to quit burning their crops. And I, I might be speaking out of turn here a little bit. Educate me if I am. Why is it okay to hunt over flooded rice? I'm not asking you to be the game warden. I'm just saying, is it traditional? Why is it traditional to have flooded rice? But then when you see somebody hunting over flooded corn, everybody's like, Oh, Oh man, that's, you know, that's, that's not right. That's not cool. Does that make sense to you? Because these ducks are going into these flooded rice fields and these farmers are making another entirely new revenue stream of being able to lease out their land to hunters so are the corn farmers you can hunt dry corn for geese mallards up in the up in the midwest feed in 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 dry corn just like they feed in dry peas in canada right why eric is it traditional to flood rice but not corn or is it traditional now to flood corn with the technology that we have well i mean Corn and rice are, I guess, very similar in the fact that they're both monocots, right? So, I mean, there's really not a, uh, they're gi- basically giant blades of grass, more or less. And I don't know that there's really much more efficient ways to do rice or corn as far as irrigation is concerned. Um, you know, I, I couldn't tell you why, you know, people make the assumption that it's okay to farm flooded rice and flooded corn but when it comes time to hunt one's okay and the other's not i mean rob may have a different opinion than i do. i don't know that technology dictates any other way of of producing a crop like corn i mean um you know you're putting a lot of nitrogen 
on corn. I mean, corn takes a tremendous amount of, of fertilizer to grow, to get a decent bushel yield per acre. Um, but you're not going to see a bunch of guys using drip tape on corn to try to get their distribution uniformity to, to, to do something different than what they're used to or accustomed to. Um, you know, certainly it's, it's awfully hard to, uh, irrigate corn with overhead sprinklers because it just gets so dang tall. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, Chad, I couldn't answer that. I might have to lean on Bob, maybe he knows. Yeah, I'll jump in, Chad. I mean, to me that, you know, you make a valid argument because the reason why rice farmers are using water, right, they can't burn. So they've got to use water and why are they using that water to, to help you know, speed the breakdown of the, you know, the organic matter, the rice stalks, right? Um, uh, and you, you can, one of the reasons that's, you know, an environmentally sound way to do it is because it, it stops deep tilling, things of that nature. Those same dynamics play in corn. And, you know, I, I, although I'm not familiar with the, with the rules and regulations in each state, um, you know, I, I just can't imagine a farmer, you know, or, or a conservationist being able to make the case that, you know, flooded, flooding corn is, is a completely valid way to break the organic matter down um, in, in a much more environmentally sound way than, than deep tillage or things of that nature that would, that would, uh, cause us to lose topsoil. So I, I don't understand that argument. Yeah. I, I think that when you put it that way and you use words like topsoil and deep tillage, explain to me in a nutshell, Rob, what the term no-till farming means, because a lot of hunters and conservationists when you hear them talk on, on the way that the migration, you guys are both, you guys are both hunters. Um, you guys both have hunted ducks. You guys are both hunted geese. When we talk about the migration, a lot of people would say, well, no till farming completely changed the migration and the migratory habits of, of migratory waterfowl going up and down the flyways. Explain to me what no till farming is. Yeah. So traditionally traditional practices, uh, Chad would be, you know, after a, a, after a crop is over and or before the next crop would begin, you would, you would, uh, deep plow or, uh, there's a lot of different terms you'll hear moldboard plow or, you know, basically turning that soil, um, anywhere from 12 to 30 inches deep. Uh, and what that would do was, uh, for several reasons, it's beneficial, right? It, it stirs the soil up. It, it dilutes the soil, uh, um, and allows, you know, to have less, uh, fungal problems with the new crop. It, it's also, uh, you know, a, a, a way to, you know, kill weeds, right? It's, it's basically a mechanically herbiciding, right? As you prepare for a new crop, um, in the case of what we just spoke about with the corn stalks, you know, um, you can't just go plant corn right behind another corn crop, you, you know, uh, um, you, you, a lot of you know, tillage has traditionally been done to to, uh, to manage organic matter and weeds. So with no-till farming, what growers have done is instead of doing the tillage, they're either um, they're, they're making applying small amounts of herbicides um, to kill you know for weed control that you were traditionally doing with the tillage, and then you're you're doing a very minor amount of tillage in order to prepare a, a small, very small percentage of the field for planting of the crop. So, um, so you're basically, uh, uh, using your, your herbicides in a very targeted, small tillage approach, um, in, in, uh, and there, so that, and then what's happening there is you're, instead of having this, this whole field you know, where the tillage is, is prepared and you're making that right for weeds, you're by, uh, by only preparing a small amount, you're making that area, um, very, uh, productive for the seed. And in the areas in between the rows where you've got dead weeds, you're using that, that, um, there's dead weeds that cover crop, uh, if, if you will, uh, of weeds or, a or, a, you know, maybe a winter wheat crop you use. And that's actually, you know, physically delaying weed germination. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, very effective and, and a very, um, 
you know, efficient way to farm. Eric, when you <clears throat> are talking about the area where you, you guys live in California, what, what are the challenges right now? And I want to, I want to start transitioning of like no-till farming and the technology is being, is evolving every day. Is farming in good shape? Is farming alive and well right now? Is it a, is it as influential as it's always been? Is it productive and economically stable as it's ever been? Um, with, I understand with the evolution of our world and how industrial America keeps expanding and we keep building our homes into, into the country and into the cropland is farming okay. And I know that you guys only live in one part of the country, so let's concentrate on the West coast. Are we in a good spot with farming up and down these States out, out West here? And is it, as healthy as you've seen it in years or is there worry right now? Well, man, that, that, that could, we could talk the rest of the show just on that one question, Chad. So, you know, farming in agriculture in California, you know, uh, Rob and I talk quite a bit, but I mean, if we, if a kid coming out of school, if I could give any kid coming out of school, any advice or going into school, I mean, Production agriculture is fantastic industry. I mean, everybody's going to have to continue to eat, right? So there's a there's a really good amount of, of job security in this industry. Um, you know, when this whole pandemic thing arose, I mean, it was instantaneous that we were deemed as an essential service. Um, so I do think there's a fair bit of stability. You know, the the California economy is simply propped up by two things, right? Tourism, obviously, is one, but agriculture is really the backbone of our entire economy out here. So, you know, I think there's always concern. There's always new regulations. There's always endangered species that issues that may pop up to where, you know, you may take a piece of farm ground and turn it into a, a, a wetland conservation area for, a, for a, a, a species, whether it's a waterfowl or um, a salamander or whatever down the coast. But, you know, I do think that uh, urban sprawl is an issue. I mean, we're taking a lot of really good farm ground and converting it to strip malls, um, you know, because nobody wants to build a strip mall on the side of a side of a cliff or a mountain. So they take the nice fertile flat piece of farm ground and plant a bunch of concrete and a bunch of buildings on it. So, I mean, that's always a concern. You know, it's interesting when you look at production, agriculture, you know, there's a certain sect of people now that are exploring the idea of, of indoor farming, right? They're talking about, you know, what's next? How are we going to feed all these people? So instead of farming outward, we're going to farm upward. You know, that's an interesting concept too. I mean, using artificial lights, you know, trying to get away from some of the synthetic pesticides, um, using solar energy to produce crops indoors. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of, of different scenarios that you can see, but, you know, I always go back to people have to eat, people have to wear clothes. People got to fuel their cars, their homes. And, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that, that agriculture produces that aren't just for food. You know, there's a lot of raw materials that are produced by the farmer in America and in California, you know, back to the corn being part of the ethanol uh, trade. You know, there's the hell there's plants in uh, Arizona that they manufacture rubber for tires. So, I mean, there, there's so many different things, whether it's, you know, industrial hemp for fiber. I mean, you can go on and on and on of the different uses of uh, of crops and, and their byproducts, crops that go into certain things. I mean, heck, you know, we, we deal with companies now that produce fertilizer from food waste. So not only do you grow the food, eat what you need from it, but then you take, take the waste from the crop, turn it into a fertilizer and put it back on next year's crop. So, I mean, it, farmers are always looking for ways to evolve and, and become more efficient. And uh, so I think that, you know, farming is here to stay. You know, I think it's going to look different as we go through 
the uh, the next half century of, of my lifetime. Um, you know, and certainly when our kids get to be our age, it, it's going to look different than it does now. But um, I, I do think as long as people have to eat, there's always going to be a need for farmers and good stewards of the land. Very well said. When staying in your area, and let's stay on the subject of feeding feeding the world, and I want to get into the byproducts that you, you, you talked about too. And I understand with how you started your statement there, Eric, was that we could talk on that all day, and I feel that we can. Rob, take it on um, California-based farmers and the explosion. We talked about the explosion of corn. Another thing that I've seen and read up on a little bit, and I'm not very well studied on it or educated, is, and it's mainly because I'm, a, I'm definitely allergic to tree nuts, but there's been a huge explosion of almond. When I grew up, because I couldn't have dairy, I drank soy. And the soy milk back in the days was the most brutal thing you could ever put in your body. Like you would get teased about it when you would break open a can of it, and then it would almost make you, you know, throw up when you drank it. But now people have almonds in everything from their milk to their coffee creamer to their yogurts to their, I mean, you name it, almonds are everywhere. So has that forced the ideology of the California farmer because of the proficiency of almond growing in California? Has it forced the rice farmers into that, me- that changing their methods to go into an orchard style operation? And if so, have you seen it to where the, it's, a, it's a whole other education process where the nutrient team has to go in and say, okay, you're looking at this long just to get to here. And then from there, we have to do this. Is, is it a big investment? And have you seen a lot of farmers in, in this area move that way with the explosion of almonds? And you both can touch on that if you want. Yeah, I'll start off. I mean, um, so yeah, the, the most of uh, the area in Northern California area, you know, there, there would always been almonds in this area, but, you know, the explosion probably 10 years ago where, where the, the demand for almonds, uh, you know, ha- has just gone through the roof. And so you've seen that progression of plantings of almonds uh, into Northern California in the areas traditionally, you know, would have never thought of, of planting almonds. And you're seeing, um, you know, uh, as you talk about the rice and, uh, you know, a lot of those farmers first buying into tree crops, uh, a lot of almonds, uh, a lot of walnuts as well. So, you know, I think it's it, for the farmer in California, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's survival, right? It's diversification and, 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 and spreading your risk amongst different crops. And, um, you know, the, the uh, the use of almonds and the the way they, the the crop has been utilized and marketed has been just amazing and and we've just seen incredible growth in acres and um uh you know it's just who would have thought uh, 20 years ago that we'd be you know that the section for for almond milk in a grocery store would be almost the size of, of dairy milk today so it it's it's incredible and it, it speaks to you know the the ability of, of modern technology to be able to use these things to, to produce goods that, uh, you know, people want. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, almonds are, almonds are, are growing, uh, in areas that, that, uh, you know, our fathers would have never, never guessed that you would put an almond tree. So, um, Eric, Yeah. I mean, Chad, you know, going back to the part of your question on the investment part of that, I mean, you know, I would say that that would be a significant investment. I mean, if I were going to go start planting today, you know, you'd certainly want to have some sort of a crystal ball approach to trying to analyze the market because from the time you plant a, a baby almond sapling to the time you can start harvesting is, you know, three to five years. And uh, you've got to understand what that market's going to do, or at least try to understand what that market's going to do, because a lot can change in that amount of time. You know, we're certainly seeing some of those effects in the wine grape industry right now. I mean, there's a lot of wine grapes that are being pulled out of the ground right now and being transitioned over the tree nuts um, or olives or what have you because of the market dynamics surrounding wines. I mean, you just don't see 
a lot of wine being consumed like you might have 10 or 15 years ago. I mean, you look at the younger generation now drinking a lot of these hard seltzers or, or craft beers or bourbons or whatever it may be, you know, the wine industry is not the same as it once was. So, you know, it, it, that certainly could happen in tree nuts at some point, you know, you are seeing other countries, you know, Argentina, China, you know, Australia, a lot of these other countries now are planting similar crops. So, I mean, you, you may get to a point where you see some saturation in some of these markets that could ultimately drive people to not put back in the ground an almond tree, you know, you know, you may see them switch to something else. So I think, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch, you know, the, you know, the other issues that are facing in California agriculture, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, concerns or, or things that surround California. Two of the things that concern us really are labor and, and the water, right? You see statistics all the time about what it takes to, how much water it takes to make a pound of beef or a pound of almonds or, you know, support an almond tree. I mean, it's it, a tremendous amount of water. Um, you know, we don't typically have as significant of, of water issues in the northern half of the state as they do down south. But uh, water is certainly something that we have to be cognizant of. And then also labor, you know, tree nuts, typically there's not a lot of hand labor, right? You, you, a lot of it's mechanized, you know, they, they shake them with a machine, they pick them up with a machine, um, you know, so there's, there's crops that are a lot more labor intensive. I mean, you get down to the coast, you know, you might have a crew of 40 people pulling weeds on a five acre lettuce field. That's a tremendous amount of expense for that grower. So you know, I, I think it's important to realize that uh, crops can change, farmers can change. To Rob's point, I mean, a lot of our rice farmers or tomato farmers, you know, they, they grow multiple crops, um, you know, to, to be insulated somewhat to where when one market might fluctuate and move downward, the other one hopefully props them up. So with the current state of the market, and I don't know if it's mainly being governed by the quarantine and the pandemic. Would you personally, Eric first and then Rob, would you start an orchard right now? But with you see the price of almonds right now or almonds, I don't even know the correct way to say it. I get corrected all the time down there. When you see the marketplace right now, would it be a good investment or, or is it is it really, you know, is it pretty, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Is it kind of a, is it, is it, you know what I'm saying, Rob, is it a bad idea to go into the almond business right now with what you've seen in the last 60 days? Yeah. I mean, right now I would say I would have to agree that it is probably not the, it is probably not the, the opportune time to go, uh, to get in the almond business today. I think that's the case with a lot of things though, but I think the question is for the almond growers, is this a, is this a, a blip that, and will return back to a normal price or is this something, you know, uh, more indicative of of supply and, and and whatnot. That's you know that's something that's um, that's not you know associated with the pandemic. So I, I don't know that we know the answer to that yet. But I know there's a lot of uncertainty in, in a lot of crops, not just almonds. That's that's driving you know pricing commodity pricing lower. So we'll see. Um, you know that the land prices in California are so high that that you know you. Obviously, today I don't think with, um, with um, you know almonds around a dollar fifty a pound a day. I don't I don't think you can make it work. But uh, but you know we'll get through this and and um, and it'll find it'll find its its normal going forward. And and uh, you know it, obviously land's going to adjust and things are going to adjust. And um, uh, you know we'll, we'll get back to to. Um, uh, you know, a, a place where growers can continue to, to farm, but, but right now it's, it's tough. And, and again, I think it's just my, in my opinion, it's, is market uncertainty, but you know, it, it, hopefully we're, we're heading out of that soon. Eric, would you say the same thing that you would kind of pump the brakes a little bit right now, personally? 
You know, Chad, I, I mean, if a guy had a hundred acres to plant right now, I think you'd want to try to plant a couple different things, right? I don't know that I'd want to plant any one thing right now. You know, I'm a little bit of a dreamer and I love walnuts more than almonds. So, you know, I love the smell of them. I love the look of them. I love, you know, everything about a walnut's more appealing to me, but they're, they're worth a heck of a lot less on the market than even an almond is. But, you know, it's, I don't know that the pandemic per se has affected us as much as the, the trade issues. You know, we're coming into an election cycle and I think all the issues we're having with China and whatnot right now and all the tariffs coming in and out and all these, these different political issues that are, that have arose over the last you know year or two certainly has probably just as much or more of an effect on our market dynamics than the, than the, the pandemic has. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, I think to spread risk, you know, somebody who's got the ability to diversify should probably do so. Um, if you're, if you're a several thousand acre grower and you're just looking to expand on your empire, then sure, you know, go plant some trees. Um, but I do think, you know, there's, there are growers that, that might grow the same crop as their next door neighbor, but they grow it in such a fashion that they dictate getting a higher price for better quality, right? Good farmers are always going to find a way to outproduce or out, you know, out uh, achieve maybe somebody next door to them that's not doing the same thing they are. I mean, farmers are kind of funny. You know, they're they like having a competitive edge, as do the people that work for us. I mean, if a guy's got something he's using and he finds that the results are better than somebody else, you know, they don't typically share their proprietary secrets, right? So it's uh, it's it's kind of an interesting world we live in. So when you when you put it in that text, Eric, do you take a personal pride as you say these you know the people that work within the nutrient organization? There is you know differences in in the ability of farmers to to nurture that land. Sometimes you'll see farms that aren't taken care of the same way other farms are. It, when when you start talking about the nutrient, the pride of nutrient. Does that wear on you or does that just become a, a stronger service <laughs> that you and Nutrien look to offer the farmer to become better, to have better techniques, to make sure that their land is always tidied up? Because I heard by a farmer in Iowa one time named Don Brothers, he said, this isn't my land. Yeah, my family's name is on it, but I'm only here for a while. When I put it back up on the shelf, I want it to look so awesome that when the next farmer takes it off that shelf and starts farming at the ground again that there's a pride that's still instilled there and it just keeps going on down the line that you know farmers don't look at themselves as like owners of the land more as more of a steward of the land so do you guys offer that and do you guys take a lot of pride when you see ground that could be better do you step in or is it are you taking a chance of stepping on some toes there also and pissing somebody off by saying that hey your your farm could look better well that's a delicate balancing act right you know, the way I look at it is, this. I mean, a piece of ground is like a child. You know, we all have children and we all want to make sure that our children have better lives than we did. We want to give our children more opportunity than we ever had. And the land's treated the same way, or at least it should be. I mean, you want to look at that piece of ground and make it better than it was the moment you set foot on it. So when you step off it, it's in better shape for the next generation. I mean, I think that, you know, transforming a piece of soil needs to be an approach that's a partnership, right? So, I mean, when you've got a grower who maybe needs help, but there might be a sense of pride there and, and, you know, they don't want to make some changes. Ultimately it's their call. We're going to do what's best for that grower. Um, but if there's an opportunity for us to help that grower improve on a practice, or, or something, then we're certainly going to take that approach. I think when a guy wakes up every morning or a gal wakes up every morning and they put on their nutrient shirt and get in a nutrient truck, there is a sense of pride. I mean, we know we're the best, but we also feel emboldened because we've got this big global corporation standing behind us, providing us with all the tools we need to go out there and improve that land 
and infertility and, you know, crop outputs where when a farmer speaks to his neighbor and his neighbor wants to know why his crop looks better than, than maybe his does, we come up in conversation as being a valued partner in, in why that is. So Rob, when you think about that mentality that Eric just spoke on and getting, putting that shirt on and getting in that truck there, I, I always talk about the provider mentality, hunters, gatherers, garden growers, living off the land. I don't think there's a cooler way to live than to harvest your own game, to harvest your own vegetables and see the earth work in so many different ways. And as Eric has taught me through the sustainability talks that we've had, um, I, I look at a farmer as you're taking care of this land and you're growing it and nurturing it and you're feeding humans, you're feeding wildlife. Then you see these humans that get to go onto these farms that are driving revenue for the owner of the land, the farmer, the farming family. And we get to hunt on these lands and we get to harvest game off of the same land that the food was just harvested for human consumption. And that wildlife has been eating on it. Now we harvest that wildlife. Now we eat that wildlife and then we teach our generations or our kids, like Eric touched on, to be providers, to be better at it than we were, to respect the resource. That's a huge thing in my life is what does it truly mean to respect the resource of the land, the farmer, the deer, the rodents, the, the nesting of mallard eggs in these farmlands and what's going on with egg salvage programs with organizations such as California Waterfowl. All of that to me is like, how could you... Ha find something to have more pride in. There's no golf game out there. There's no business model out there that you could take more pride in than being a farmer, a provider, having that mentality. So with that being said, what is going on within your guys's walls right now at Nutrien? What are you guys doing that we don't know about? Because I often say I wake up here out on the West coast and a farmer's been in his combine for three hours already in the Midwest in Kansas, and we don't even know what's going on. We don't know that that farming's being done. We just take it for granted, and that's how we started this conversation. What is Nutrien doing right now? Because you guys are dealing with the coolest people in the world, hunters and gatherers and farmers and, and land stewards of the land. What are You guys are already the best there is. How do you stay there and what's being said between these walls and these zoom meetings right now within your, your, your infrastructure without giving away any secrets, obviously, but talk to me about that pride and what the next steps are coming out of this quarantine and making sure that this mentality of the, the, the provider is strong as it's ever been. There's, there's really no secrets, Chad. I mean, for us, it's just, how do we, how do we help make our, our customers stronger faster, better at what they do every day so they can be, um, you know, productive, take care of the land. Uh, you know, we're all beneficiaries, as you mentioned, the, the, the wildlife part of it. I think, you know, that's a great thing about this business is you, you get to, you get to be with people that are just, it, it's, we're, we're really drilling down to the basics of, 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 uh, what makes life right. You got to have food, you got to have fiber, you got to have, uh, you know, a roof over your head and, and we get to work with these guys every day. So, um, you know, just our goal is really simple. It's, uh, you know, we said feed the world earlier, but we, we have to do that through, you know, these this greatest group of people there are, you know, the American farmer that that, uh, you know, puts their resources and their time and their effort every day into you know doing something that, that probably isn't appreciated enough. Right. To give us all. Uh, not not just the food and the fiber and the you know the timber to put roof over, roofs over our head, but to give us this awesome you know uh, resource and wa waterfowl and you know big game that we're we're able to enjoy. And the reason we're we're able to enjoy it enjoy it uh, is because the farmer is so successful. So you know, it kind of all ties back in together. But you know, we we have a healthy farmer. We're going to have a healthy nutrient you know, and, and, you know, it all ties back together. So that, that's what we're thinking about every day. And there, there's a lot of pieces of that, but it really boils down to that. How can we make them better, uh, faster, more profitable, more efficient and, uh, and, you know, go from there. Would your answer be along the same lines, Eric? Yeah. I mean, I think the only thing I would expand upon 
Chad is, I mean, a big focus for us is recruitment. I mean, recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. I mean, we're, we not only want to recruit the best customers and the best farmers, we also want to recruit and develop the best employees, right? I mean, ultimately where our company succeeds and fails is on the quality of the people that work for our company, right? I mean, our, our people are by and large our best asset, our, our most important asset. Um, so, I mean, we take a lot of pride in, in having the best people and we continue to take pride in, in recruiting the best people and developing that, that, uh, those people internally. Um, and also, you know, I think a lot of focus and emphasis goes into our own proprietary offerings. I mean, whether those are products, um, whether that's our new digital tools we're developing, whether it's, uh, you know, during quarantine adapting and and making it to where we can do online pickups, like a big box store, um, online bill payments. I mean, you name it, we're doing it right now. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a difficult market, just like a lot of these other brick and mortar type operations, you know, with, with, uh, more and more of our business shifting to digital. Um, we are certainly trying to maintain the lead in that segment as well. So, but yeah, along the lines of what Rob said, I mean, it, we're, we are trying to do the best we can at every turn. And I do think that, uh, I don't know that there's a big secret. I mean, it's just outworking your competition. I, I guess there's got to be some kind of proprietary information that's in those walls. And I know that you guys, I would never even ask on that stuff, but you guys have obviously done what you just stated and outworking your competition and, and, and not worrying about competition, staying in your lane, staying focused, but knowing that there is competition out there and you respect that competition. Um, just like farmers respect other farmers, they're competitive, but at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're trying to achieve the same goals and, you guys have farmers that live next door to each other and take care of land next door to each other with all of the same stuff that you're supplying each of them. So it's almost like nutrient is putting farmers on the same playing field. You know, if you're talking about competition, you got to talk about talent. You got to talk about if you have all the means to be the best and nutrient is supplying this to whoever wants to be the best then a farmer and a, a generational farmer has no excuse not to have their land producing the best that it's ever done in the history of the world with what nutrients working on on a daily basis. That's how I look at it is that the playing field has been evened. Now you might not have as much of that playing field, but with that land that you do have, you have the ability to stay as, as staunch as you possibly have ever been as a farmer. I don't know if that's looking at it in too of too much of a competitive way, but I look at it like the playing field has been leveled by nutrient. Everybody has the same ability to maximize and capitalize the best of their, their, the, of what that land can do now. And I think that that's what nutrient has done. I don't know if that, if that's fair to say, but would you agree with that, that the playing field has been leveled by nutrient? I don't know that the playing field I, I maybe wouldn't use the term leveled, but I mean, I do think that, you know, if all things were eco agronomically speaking, you know, if we were growing the same soil type and texture, the same crop, you know, back to my previous comments about it being a partnership with the grower, you know, the product offerings that we have or our competitors have, it's so vast, Chad. I mean, it's, it's, there might be a hundred different things you could use on that acre. And it really, the partnership is the key here because, you know, we have consultants and that's exactly what they are. They might give you 10 different options, you know, in varying price points or varying, you know, cost benefit analysis. Um, but it's ultimately the grower's decision to figure out what they want to do or what approach they want to take. You know, it gives them the ability to really steer the way their operation goes and make the decision with all the information available what they want to do. So, you know, we do have a lot of good competitors. Our competitors hire a lot of good people as well. So, you know, that keeps somebody sharp in the field, right? I mean, if you know your competitors are nipping at your heels at every turn or we're nipping at theirs, I mean, it, it forces you to be on top of your game. 
because the minute you fall asleep, somebody else is in the door. Makes total sense. Rob, you feel the same? I do. I mean, uh, you know, good competition in this industry. I, you know, nutrients the best. Um, no question about it. But there's a lot of good competitors. And, and you know, our, our differentiating factor, I think, is our, our people and our experience. Um, and, you know, it's um, uh, competition makes everything better. Uh, so, but, uh, but we're confident that, you know, we can, we can offer a farmer everything they need and, uh, you know, get them across the finish line. That's what we uh, shoot for every day. I want to continue this conversation in another podcast with both of you, Rob and Eric. And I want to talk about farming and ranching and the differences and how the ecosystem supports both, what sustainability means to both of those. And then I want to talk about all of the different parts of that infrastructure of the farm and the ranch and how nutrient supports those different infrastructures and business models. Because I look at it in a lot of different ways of you go into a place like the grapevine in Southern California and you see cattle thriving in some of those mountainous areas. Is that something that nutrient helps with in that kind of, you know, free flowing cattle feeding where they want kind of atmosphere on those type of you know, bodies of land and farms, or is that considered a ranch? And what is a, you know, I want to get to the bottom of how the ecosystem is developed within both of those types of organizations and how nutrient is there to help both of them. It's, it's always been a question of mine because a Montana cattle rancher is not the same as a California rice farmer, or are they? And does nutrient put both of those type of, of individual families or organizations on the same level too, with the services and consultation that nutrient provides and offers through their through their company so i want to get back into that i'll get back with both of you on scheduling it i appreciate both of your time i'm proud of the partnership i want to keep learning more and more because i'm just i'm so um, infatuated by farming and ranching and in the ecosystem and living off of the land and paying homage to what these or these families are doing through the generations so is that fair to say can we get back on and talk about some of that stuff yeah you will look forward to it chad and then Maybe we can do it in person and then go to Makuni and have some uh, raw fish. <laughs> it raw would be fish. great. We're looking there, forward to that. I have not had sushi one time in, since since March 15th. I ate it in, at spring training. I got off the plane in, in spring training and they shut down baseball. I went to sushi one night and I haven't had it since. And I'm like seriously like a crackhead, like going through fits and stuff, man. You got lots of good sushi in Reno. You got to, you got to. I know, but a lot of them, a lot of them aren't open still. And a lot, and a lot of them weren't even offering takeout really. Really? Yeah. I bought some gift cards though to use when it opens back up. The sushi, the sushi places here, I think, unless you know of any, Eric, I think they've all pretty much stayed open. Well, they all have takeout, man, but takeout's just not the same. It's not. I agree with you. I agree with you. Not the same at all. If they're going to, you know, a lot, a lot of these places are going to be able to stay in business. I hope they are too. I, I think they will. I think, I think that they're being supported enough. I bought enough gift cards and stuff like that to use after to, you know, keep some revenue going into a bunch of different local places and sushi restaurants. So man, guys, I appreciate it. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll be in touch. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Everybody yeah. out there, pay attention to farming the land, pay homage to farmers, check out nutrient ag solutions and just look at what they're doing. Look into their history, look into their story, look into their culture. And there's companies like that out there that we take for granted that are making our world go round as we know it as we wake up and go to our jobs and see that food on our tables whether in our homes or in our local restaurants it's companies like nutrient that are providing the services to the growers and the the land the stewards of the land out there to give us the lives that we're so lucky to be living so we're humbled by it this episode of this life ain't for everybody podcast again was brought to you by friends at nutrient ag solutions you can find them all over social media as well as their websites dm us if you need any more information to find out all about all of their services we look forward to our future as a partner with nutrient and i'm so excited about the projects that we're going to get involved in with them rob thank you eric thank you tom Hit that button. This is Leith Lofton singing a song he wrote with our good buddy Drake White. What you going to do when the money's all gone? Y'all take care. Peace.